issue is more along the lines of nobody knows what money is because it's basically an open-ended architecture. We have a bank-centered system. That's what the euro dollar actually means. It's, uh, it's, I think the issue is more along the lines of nobody knows what money is because it's basically an open-ended architecture. We have a bank-centered system. That's what the euro dollar actually means. There's no physical cash. There's no, there's no Federal Reserve notes uh, being circulated around the world in pallets. Um, it's simply how banks talk to each other. And the way banks talk to each other is different all the time, and it's constantly evolving. So you look at the euro dollar system 20 years ago, it doesn't look like anything like it does today. And today, it's almost entirely derivatives, currency swaps. Now, how do we look at a currency swap in terms of a monetary format? Well, it works as money, but yet it doesn't go on a balance sheet anywhere. Well, it does. I mean, it goes in the footnotes, but it doesn't get accounted for in the same way as a, as a specific monetary unit would. So we have no idea really what banks are doing because they don't tell us. Governments don't force us force them to tell us. And they could be doing any number of things. They could be engineering all sorts of financial products that we don't know about. So actually defining money in the modern system is literally impossible. And that's really, again, instability. But where, where would that come from? I mean, it comes from the fact that we can't even define, let alone measure, let alone monitor and control and regulate a monetary system nobody really understands. And they, what they do is they get a, a $5 bill, right? And say, this piece of paper is money. And the thing is, nobody, it, in any major industrial economy, hand-to-hand -hand currency died out over a century ago. We've been using virtual currency for over a century. When you write a check, what happens? It goes into the banking system and a bunch of book entries happen. That's very different than what, we're, what we conceive of when we think about using hand-to-hand -hand currency. And in the euro dollar system, it began in the 1950s so that it didn't have to use hand-to-hand -hand currency. It's a reserveless ledger money system. So defining money becomes literally impossible. And that's really my central contention against Ben Bernanke was that it was his job, at least the Federal Reserve's job and his predecessor's job, to be on top of this evolution, but they, get, they threw up their hands in the 1970s and said, we don't know how to define this stuff, so we're not going to bother. We're going to target an interest rate because we cannot define and control the money supply, which means that you're not a central bank, you're just trying to manipulate psychology. It's a very different form of monetary policy. It's non-money monetary policy because the, the original problem is we don't know what money is in the banking system. I think it's, it's you start with transparency. It has to be a regime. You know, part of the, the reason the euro dollar expanded and grew as much as it did was because it was user friendly. Now, user friendly in that case was the banking system, large corporations, sometimes you know, large financial firms and, and governments around the world. So it was user friendly because it allowed each of these participants to do what they needed to do, which is money's, you know, that's the real secret of money in the modern in modern a modern economy, is that it unlocks these the potential for, again, commerce to do what commerce needs to do. So a ideal monetary system would be both transparent and user-friendly, which, again, gets you into the digital currency space because that's exactly where everybody's going in that direction for a reason, because I think it's innate human nature to want money to be what money's supposed to be, a transparent tool that allows commerce to happen. It's not wealth. It's not the goal in and of itself. It's a tool that, you know, it's a modern tool that we use to help make an efficient, sustainable economic system go. The, the euro dollar replaced Bretton Woods long before 1971. The euro dollar was undertaking the roles that Bretton Woods was supposed to be doing from the late 1950s forward. So there was already a, con a transformation before we ever got to August 19. August 1971, Nixon closing the gold window was a ceremonial effort. It, nothing else. And then all those charts you see, that was the effect of the euro dollar on globalization. Not money printing in the U.S., that was the ability, especially the wage charts, that was the ability for companies to then unlock untapped labor pools all over the world. And the reason they were able to do that was because now you had a global reserve currency that was available in many places. So a company that used to be, uh, it's too expensive, we, we don't have enough money, I mean, we can't, Chinese yuan, we can't use Chinese yuan. We can intermediate through dollars because now we have this global dollar regime, which means we can pay for resources, we can pay for labor, we can pay for foreign direct investment, all in one big hole. So 1971 isn't about the closing of the gold window. It's about when the corporate America and corporations around the world who had been using the euro dollar system for 15 years by that point 
started to really unlock all of these secrets. And really, in one respect, I know, I know what that means. It was, it was positive. When you look at it from, and I grew up in the Rust Belt, so I know, I know the downside to globalization here. I lived it. Um, but for vast majority of the populations around the world, the euro dollar uh, uh, led to tremendous amounts of prosperity all over the place. Look at China's transformation. Look at Asia's transformation. That would not have been possible without this global currency system. The shortage actually means that we don't, the Federal Reserve, the federal government don't print money. Money printing, money creation is the responsibility of the banks operating this global monetary system. It's no different than the fractional reserve system. Banks create money through credit creation, except they don't do it in the same ways because there's in the euro dollar system, there is no reserve to fraction. It's essentially balance sheet mechanics. I don't know if, how far you want to get into the details there. We want details. It's essentially based on a lot of mathematics, uh, modeling, VAR, Vega. Um, if you're running a bank, how much credit you create is based on risk perceptions, present value calculations. It's all math. It's all about derivatives. It's all about these kinds of uh, deep financial inputs that allow commercial banks to either expand their balance sheet or force them to contract. And what we've seen since 2000, August 9th of 2007 is banks have been forced to contract. So they're contracting money and they're contracting credit. And they have been pretty much continuously. And when I say contract, let me, let, me, let me be specific here. I don't mean shrinking. I mean growing at a different rate. Okay. We live in a nonlinear world, which means that if we we're growing at, say, 10% per year, and all of a sudden you're growing at 5% per year, that's a massive contraction, especially if you spread that out over 15 years. That's a huge, enormous contraction. So it's not like we're actually shrinking the pile of banks, although a lot of banks have gotten smaller. But by and large, the whole overall, the credit system globally used to grow rapidly. And now it's kind of just piddling along. And because it's kind of piddling along, we, had, we don't have enough money around the rest of the world. What happens? Governments try to fill in the gap. How do governments try to fill in that monetary gap? Well, they do what they do, which means they, they, they knock on the door of the central banker and say, hey, isn't this a money issue? And the central banker says, we don't do money, but we'll do something because we have to. And so what have central banks been doing over the last 15 years? Quantitative easing. So people think central banks have been filling the gap with bank reserves when bank reserves don't really have much of a role in the euro dollar system. So you have this persistent dollar shortage that nobody knows about. And this, these governments, the persistent need for central banks and governments to do something about it, which everybody does. It leads to this confusion where we have disinflation or deflationary money globally, but everybody thinks monetary system has exploded. The Fed constantly evolves these tactics because it can never solve the, the big issue, which is balance sheet constraint of all these global banks that used to create dollars freely, who can no longer do so for various reasons. When you write a check, what happens? No cash is moved. No. It's a book entry. Yeah, it's a promise. So that's how the system works. It's all about book entries. So if it's you writing a check to pay for groceries, if it's you using a debit card to pay for groceries, it's no different if you use a credit card. What happens with a credit card is a different set of book entries happen where the bank doesn't, doesn't create a deposit for you. It goes to an SIV and creates a deposit there where the SIV owns the paper or the cash flow streams from the credit card that you just used. But it's all just book entries. So the, all the banks really do are blockchain transactions. They just keep track of who owes what to whom. That's all it is. And we've privileged these banks because we have in our mind this idea that they have cash in a vault. When they don't. I mean, some of them do, but they don't. They don't really. But this, this is...